little brothers and sisters. Last week, I recorded a video on the Antichrist, which I felt like contained a lot of important insight that we need to take into account right now. I hope you had a chance to view it. If you haven't, you can find it easily on our Renewal Ministries YouTube channel. Today, I'd like to talk about, after the election, what now? On October 7th, last year, 2020, about a month before the November American elections, I did a video that was titled, The American Election, Its Global Consequences. The reason why I did it is because a number of people in different countries were saying, as America goes, so goes the world, including Cardinal Mueller. But also there were other people on the other side, like George Soros and people who are really working to implement a Marxist socialist agenda throughout the world saying, as America goes, so goes the world. And uh, some of them said that the current American administration at that time uh, was the only thing holding back a global reset where the elites of the world could take control. Well, we, we know that there's a new administration now. We know the new administration is committed to lots of things that are going to ratchet up the pressure on Christians. We know the new administration is committed to expanding access and funding and removing limitations on aborting little babies, cutting them up into little pieces, killing them, crushing their brains, injecting poison into them up until the moment of birth. And there's even a number of people now are saying, no, we don't want to, we don't want to save the lives of babies that are born alive from failed attempts to kill them. What kind of, what kind of country are we going to live in if, if that's the case? But it's not just that. It's the whole Christian vision of marriage and sexuality. Marriage between a, a man and a woman open to life is under aggressive attack. You know, it's already crumbling. It's been crumbling for years in the United States and in many countries around the world. And it's just going to crumble some more. Not only that. Uh, religious freedom is going to be reduced in its priority, and it's going to become something subordinate to the sexual revolution reaching its insane conclusion where no longer is there anything as biological reality, no longer does it mean anything whether you're a biological man or woman, but you can, you can pretend to be whoever you want to be, and the rest of us have to burn incense to it. The rest of us have to honor it, pretend like it's real when it's just not real. So I'd like to talk now, actually at the end of that video I did in October before the election, I, I re reflected a little bit about different outcomes. I said, if the uh, pro-life, pro-religious freedom, uh, pro-marriage and family uh, candidates win, we'll, we'll have another four years or another two years or whatever length of time it would be where we're able to hold back the evil and not be forced to burn incense to Caesar and not be forced to violate our consciences and maybe not be discriminated against as badly as we would be if those candidates lose. Then I said, if those pro-life, pro-religious freedom candidates lose, uh, the spiritual battle is still going on. Even if they win, the spiritual battle is still going on because even if we're able to hold back evil for another four years, uh, evil is not going to give up because it's not just a matter of uh, human beings and political parties. Tremendously powerful forces are at work. Just like St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, our battle is not just against flesh and blood. It's not just a matter of elections. It's a matter of really powerful spiritual forces that are trying to insinuate deception, lies, fear into people's lives so that they uh, cower before the powers of this world and, and no longer have the courage or boldness or confidence or certainty of faith to be a faithful witness to Christ. Well, we know that those candidates lost, and we also know that the current candidates who are in office are really dedicated to some pretty evil things, and it's going to put tremendous pressure on us. I talked all about this in the video last October. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, I think you'll find it illuminating uh, many of the things I talked about there are now unfolding. But again, what I said at the end of the video is we don't have a lasting city here below. 
Our salvation isn't in political candidates or political parties. Our salvation is in Jesus Christ, who really need to look to him as the source of wisdom, guidance, and leadership in the days ahead. So what's been happening since the election here in the United States? And I, I know that this is also relevant to other countries around the world, like Cardinal Mueller said, as America goes, so goes the world. I think that's very unfortunate. I think that's extremely unfortunate. One country shouldn't have that influence, and hopefully it won't. But this country has been in the past extremely aggressive in trying to convey these, uh, this rebellion against God's plan into other countries as well through foreign aid, through political pressure. And there's, there's lots of fifth columns and a lot of other countries that want to cooperate with this. And it's happening in a country close to you. Okay, what's been happening since the election? We've seen a much more sudden and much more aggression, much more aggressive attempt to stifle dissent and free speech than I thought would happen. It's happening a lot more quickly. It's happening a lot more radically. It's happening with a lot more totalitarian power and force against it. There's an aggressive purge and shaming and proposed prosecution of all those who in any way dare to a question uh, election procedures or election results, even when there was pretty significant evidence that there were irregularities in the elections in certain states. Anybody now who dares to question that is considered treasonous, an enemy of the state, and, and people are being fired from their jobs. Uh, people are being uh, thrown off boards of directors of major corporations. Uh, a, a, a distinguished Harvard University graduate uh, who expressed concerns about some of the election procedures and some of the things that are happening. Uh, there's a petition now amongst Harvard students, graduates and administrators to take away her degree because of her political views. So it's really getting pretty aggressive, pretty ugly, pretty painful. And it's proceeding with uh, remarkable ruthlessness and boldness. And God help anybody who engages in peaceful protest because now, because of the very unfortunate violence at the Capitol uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, anybody now who protests is going to be labeled an insurrectionist. I, I do think there were a very small number of people who invaded the Capitol who were insurrectionists, like trying to overthrow the government. A lot of people were, were there because they were misled, because they wanted to make a statement, they went too far, they should be prosecuted. But we can't have a double standard on prosecution for months and months and months. Cities were burning, uh, businesses were burning, federal buildings were under siege, uh, riots were happening all over the country, and local authorities refused to prosecute those who were throwing Molotov cocktails, uh, smashing windows, looting, stealing, rioting, taking over uh, jurisdiction of cities, declaring them independent free zones of people who were rioting. And now people are being prosecuted for uh, trespassing or worse, you know, at the Capitol, and they should be prosecuted. But it's such a double standard. It's, it's just unbelievable. There's such hypocrisy uh, for all the looting, burning, rioting, killing, uh, shootings that were happening uh, all summer and into the fall. Now, what's happening is that almost every powerful segment of our society has somehow coalesced together. And I don't think this can be explained without supernatural power. It's censoring, canceling, and intimidating alternative viewpoints. Huge corporations whose products we buy, all the major social media companies who are now canceling accounts for political reasons, all much of professional sports, the dominant entertainment industry, all the major social media outlets like traditional newspapers and television and cable news, with a few exceptions, much of professional sports, uh, virtually all the major universities, and now all the governmental agencies, both the United States, and this is true also in Canada, are coalescing to uh, try to remove, try to shame, try to distance, try to exclude those parts of the population that aren't going along 
with the new agenda, which contains so many things that are directly contradictory to the Lord. So this is a time and this is a situation where we're going to need more boldness, more courage, more humility, more prayer than ever. People are being fired from their jobs. If there's any hint of using freedom of speech or freedom of association, that those in power are now deeming treasonous. It's hard to believe that all this is happening, but it is. I knew we were moving in this direction. I knew this was what at stake, what was at stake in the last election. But quite honestly, I didn't expect a catalyzing event like the uh, demonstrations and incursions at the Capitol to be so ruthlessly and aggressively taking advantage of to try to shut down all opposition. There are even people in the government now, in Congress, and in the House of Representatives, and the Senate saying any legislator who questioned the election results, who wanted to do audits, who wanted to look into charges of election fraud should be expelled from the Senate or House of Representatives. Uh, 80% of the major corporations that supported these candidates, these senators and these representatives have now taken away their financial support. There's a concerted attempt to make it impossible for opposition leaders who've shown any gumption at all to ever again win re-election. Now, there could be a significant uh, blowback against this. Maybe people are overplaying their hands. Maybe they're going too far. There are a few liberals here and there who are saying, wait a second, this is violating our values. But a lot of people are saying this is now not only a post-Christian society, this is a now post-liberal society where freedom of speech and freedom of thought is no longer valued, but rather imposing the correct view that the technological and political and educational elites think everybody should have to live to. It's a new gospel. It, it's a new belief system. It's a new morality that ignores the killing of babies, that ignores euthanasia, that ignores compelling people to violate their conscience in the name of in a new enlightened society which has basically declared its independence from God. It goes right back to the garden. It goes right back to that fundamental deception, that fundamental lie of the devil, tempting our first parents to say, you know what? You don't have to obey God. And you're a fool if you do. You can declare independence. You can be like gods. What a horrible lie. What an incredible deception and what horrible misery came from it. And there's nothing but misery that's going to come from that lie as it's being implemented today. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Those who are trying to accommodate to the culture, those who are trying to be on the right side of history, those who are violating their consciences in order to go along and get along, are going to find themselves going over a cliff. And they're going to find themselves, if they persist in their foolishness, if they persist in their rebellion on the last day, the door will have closed and they will have not entered the kingdom. They will have not repented. And they're going to be excluded from the Father's house forever if they don't repent in time. That's the truth. That's the gospel truth. Now, I didn't expect it to happen so suddenly, so comprehensively. It's almost like totalitarian control is being imposed overnight. The aggressive support of killing babies in the womb, suffocating religious freedom, denying conscious exceptions for Catholic medical providers, and once again, trying to force the little sisters of the poor and other entities like them to provide contraceptive insurance coverage, which is against their conscience. It's going on. It's going to happen. They're doubling down. Free speech and freedom of religion are under grave and powerful attack. And the wickedness and foolishness of it all is ignored by those who don't want to be confused by the facts. Departing from God's way will be the end of civil society as we know it, and possibly the end of this country. Those of you who listen to my videos on Father Michael Scanlon's prophecies from 1976 and 1980 know that there's a terrible warning there about son of man. Do you see this country which you love? Are you prepared to live with no country? Are you prepared to depend only on me? Son of man, 
Are you prepared to see lawlessness in the streets and to live with no protection except the protection I give you? Son of man, are you prepared to see all these structures that you're trying so hard to preserve, parishes and schools, uh, fall apart and have nothing except me? Are you prepared to see it all shut down? And when it's all shut down and you've learned to depend only on me, then you will know what I am about. That's the note of hope. All of this is happening under the providence of God. Nothing's happening right now, including the election's results that God hasn't permitted. We don't fully understand why he's permitting evil to gain the ascendancy in such a radical and sudden, almost overnight way, but he's doing it for a purpose. What could that purpose be? Maybe he wants wickedness to ripen. Maybe he wants all those who have their hearts turned away from the Lord to manifest their commitment to another gospel. Maybe he wants those who know him to double down on their commitment to him, to choose more clearly, to get, get their feet out of the world and into the kingdom. You know, in, in, in my book, A Church in Crises, Pathways Forward, I have a whole chapter devoted to stop straddling the issue. I think it's chapter five. And it talks about how the Lord wants us to stop straddling the issue to really commit ourselves to the person of Jesus, but also to commit ourselves to his actual objective teaching that we find in scripture and tradition and in the catechism of the Catholic Church. Those who magic magically invoke the phrase, follow the science, only follow the science, and sometimes it's manufactured science when it suits their ideological goals. We're seeing remarkable reversals now on following the science. For a long time, the science supposedly said, schools are a dangerous place where the virus can be spread. Now, more and more people who said that are saying, actually, as a matter of fact, science shows that the virus isn't being uh, you know, spread in schools and we need to reopen the schools and reopen the economy. Some, perhaps cynically, perhaps wisely are saying, now that there's a new administration, we don't have to make people so afraid anymore. We don't have to keep people suffering some more. I don't know. We'll have to see. Now, if you haven't seen my commentary on Father Michael Scanlon's prophecies, I'd encourage you to uh, put in your search box, uh, YouTube, Ralph Martin, Father Michael Scanlon's prophecies, or go to our Renewal Ministries YouTube channel, put in Renewal Ministries YouTube channel, and in the search box, you can just say Father Michael Scanlon's 1976 prophecy, and then there's also one from 1980. It's tremendously relevant to this time. I was just giving a retreat for 143 priests in Texas a few weeks ago with Scott Hahn, and I spoke on these prophecies, and I'd say it, it, really, it really connected. I think it really helped a lot of priests get really clear about what we're facing and make some decisions in their personal life as well as in their ministry life that's going to help people. This has all happened with such suddenness and with such viciousness, I don't think it can be explained without acknowledging that demonic powers and principalities are involved. Then one of the Psalms says, the nations are arraying. They're, they're, they're marshalling against God, but God is sitting in his heaven is laughing. The foolishness of the human race, thinking that a rebellion against God can hurt God in any way. God only permits people to rebel so that they either are given a chance to repent and be saved by Jesus Christ. You see this icon back here behind me? I've been meditating on it every day. It is so amazing that the all holy, almighty, infinite God who dwells in inaccessible light and is from age to age, eternal and immortal, and immensely, transcendently beautiful, transcendently good, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now in the person of Jesus, we can see God. We can see what he's like. We can see his love, but we can also see his justice. We can see his holiness, but we also, and we can see his compassion but we also can see his solemn, serious warnings that if we don't believe his word, if we don't say yes to our need for the forgiveness of sins, if we don't accept his mercy by repenting and believing, we will not be saved. 
the, the Son of God has entered the world, and he's asking us to take his hand. He's asking us to recognize that he's the vine, and we need to be grafted into him. We need to be his branches. We need to live by his grace and live in his friendship and live in his love through faith, through the sacraments, by eating his body, drinking his blood, by meditating on the word of God. And every time when I read my little Magnificat over here and I meditate on the face of Jesus, I'm saying, wow, God is loving us so much. He's showing so much kind to us. He's showing us a way of our, our, our hard hearts being transformed by staying connected to Jesus and allowing the heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary to, to be a source of purity for us, a source of power for us, a source of transformation. Now, many of us are fighting discouragement, depression, sadness, anger, frustration, and even doubt. The continuing suffocating COVID-19 virus and its escalating variants put a pall over everything. And many are discouraged that our intense prayer and intercession didn't block all this from happening. Many are distressed that many of our bishops didn't and don't speak clearly or give real leadership or even sometimes sympathetic to the powers that are oppressing us. I must admit it is very distressing to see the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C., almost fawning over the new administration and glad to be in dialogue with them and unabashedly uh, giving communion to politicians who are committed to doubling down on the killing of babies and all the other things. It was so distressing before the election to have the official bishop statements coming out of the bishop's conference in Washington, D.C., saying, well, you know what? Uh, abortion is our primary concern. Killing babies is our primary concern. But there's so many other considerations like immigration and climate change. And, you know, a, a Catholic could actually vote for a, a pro-abortion candidate uh, and an anti-religious freedom uh, candidate uh, if there were other issues that he felt like were, you know, very important or more important. Uh, you know, in the big scheme of things, balancing everything out, as long as he wasn't voting for that candidate for the reasons of immorality, uh, even though the candidate was going to divorce, uh, you know, advance these immoral positions. Okay. Confusing for the average Catholic. Not a clear sound from the trumpet. Can't we say that voting for these candidates is voting for the persecution of the church and the killing of babies? and the mockery of, of marriage and family life. Can't we say that clearly? See, there's nothing that really outweighs that, that these other issues are important, but they don't outweigh these issues. We couldn't say that. The bishops didn't say that before the election. Then when the election happened, the president of the bishops conference said, we wanna congratulate and offer our support to the second Catholic president. Well, I can't say that our two Catholic presidents have set a very good example of what it means to be a Catholic. And it almost seems like the bishops were like affirming the legitimate authentic Catholicism of people who openly flaunt the teaching of the church on really serious matters and insist on receiving communion, even though they really aren't supposed to. Thank God we had Archbishop Chapu, who recently retired as Archbishop of Philadelphia, uh, say, Cardinal Gregory, you shouldn't be doing this. We have a committee working on this issue and we don't think that this is what we should do. You know, we don't think we should affirm people who are opposing the most important moral issues uh, to be given communion, you know, and uh, we, we got to start making that clear. And so this is the division in the church that I've been talking about. This is the attack from the culture I've been talking about in this book, A Church in Crisis. It's so good to hear Archbishop Chapu speak out, but it's so distressing to see these pictures now of the, the Archbishop of Washington giving communion to the most aggressive Catholic in, in name politicians who are just so opposed and want to really 
suffocate religious freedom and continue killing babies. So many are tempted to doubt the efficacy of prayer or the goodness of God, or just are tempted to profound discouragement, anger, frustration, and doubt. Here's one of my main messages today. Don't give in to this spirit of sadness, of discouragement, of doubt, of anger, or frustration. Resist it. St. Ignatius of Loyola says, discouragement is never from the Lord. It's a human emotion that the devil uses to cut us off from the power and joy of faith. Scripture says, our faith overcomes the world. And the power that's at work in us is greater than the power that's at work in the world. And if you're in Jesus Christ, you don't have to be afraid of the world. You don't have to be afraid of the devil. You only have to be afraid of offending the Lord. Jesus said, you know, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Be afraid of those who can kill the body and the soul and condemn you to hell. Like Jesus said, if you're right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better to enter the kingdom missing a hand or an arm or an eye than to go down to hell with an intact body. So brothers and sisters, we are called to a level of courage, a level of clarity, a level of resolve, not to deny Christ before men, not to please men more than God, not to give in to cultural pressure that may require us to burn incense to the new emperor. We can't burn incense to the new emperor. We can't burn incense to lies. We can't burn incense to rebellion against God. But we need courage from from above. We need power from on high. We need the power of Christ dwelling in us to be capable of that. Like Jesus says, he says, when they bring you up before kings and rulers and authorities and courts, Don't worry about what you're going to say, because I will let you know in that moment what you need to say. So we need to learn a new level of living and daily trust in the Lord. You know, in the Lord's Prayer every day, we say, give us this day our daily bread. We we don't get the manna that came to the Israelites in the the, uh, desert didn't last for more than a day, except it would last over the Sabbath. We, 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 we can't get the grace we need for the situations we'll face in the future now. We need to prepare ourselves for ever deepening our relationship with the Lord. We need to look every day for the help of the Lord to do what we need to do that day. Uh, going to work in the morning, uh, making the beds, washing the dishes, taking care of children, going to the doctors, uh, offering our suffering and union with Jesus for the reparation of sins and the conversion of sinners and for mercy on our country. So, St. Ignatius of Loyola says, Don't ever give in to discouragement. It always should be resisted. And the Lord uses our natural tendency to human discouragement uh, to, to give us an invitation to draw our strength from him. The devil wants to use our human discouragement to cut us off from faith, to cut us off from hope. There's no hope. Everything's lost. No, everything isn't lost. Nothing that's happening is happening with, except with the permission of God, and he's got a plan to bring good out of it. That last line of Father Michael's prophecy, when you've learned to depend only on me and not all these other things, even your country, even your police departments, even your church structures, even when the church doors are closed, when you've learned to depend only on me, then you'll see what I'm about. Brothers and sisters, it's absolutely true that God heard all our prayers and valued all our sacrifices, and will answer them in a way we weren't anticipating, but in a way that will be fully satisfied when we see it unfold. His thoughts are far above our thoughts. His ways are far above our ways. But he is so wise. He is so powerful. He's so good. One day we will see what his plan was in allowing the election result that just happened. But now we have to make a choice. Are we going to give in to discouragement or are we going to resist discouragement? Resisting discouragement is very much like resisting the devil. It says in scripture, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So brothers and sisters, resist the devil, resist discouragement. Keep making acts of faith and acts of hope and acts of love in the Lord because they're well warranted. They're well justified. They're going to bring us into 
contact and reality with them. Cardinal Rassinger prophesied this many years ago when he was just a German priest. And in our March newsletter, we're going to publish his uh, prophetic, prophetic sense again. Years ago, way back in late 1960s, early 70s, he said, you know what? A tremendous trial awaits the church. The church is going to lose much of its power, much of its influence, many of its buildings, many of its structures, many of its members. It's going to go through a tremendous trial. But out of that trial is going to come a purified church out of which an immense explosion of light and love will come. And people who have been unspeakably lonely in a soulless technological culture will once again be able to find a home that they've always been looking for, where real love and real life and real humanity can be found. So uh, sign up for our newsletter. It's going to be in our March newsletter. Uh, and also, I want to tell you that, you know, everything that's happening, you know, websites are being shut down. Social media is being shut down. If for some reason, we're not expecting this, but it could happen. If for some reason we have to move to another vehicle to bring these vid videos to you, the only way we'll be able to communicate with you is if we have your email address. So go to our website, renewalministries.net, and I think right there on the home page should be an opportunity to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, it will come to you. It's free, no obligation. You never have to contribute. And if you don't like it, it'll stop coming to you automatically after six months. You never have to contribute to, to keep getting it if you want to keep getting it. And uh, at least we'll be able to communicate with you if for some reason we can't keep getting these videos to you the way we are now. Uh, Peter Herbeck and I are trying each week, uh, most weeks, to give you a new video that will hopefully encourage you, strengthen you, give you clarity and perspective, and, and give you the support you need from brothers in the Lord and sisters in the Lord to navigate the time we're living in. False optimism has been exposed, and what remains now is true and real hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is that certain knowledge that Christ has and will triumph. Looking back at this icon, I just think, for, for a thousand or more, for thousands of years, the world lived in hopelessness. All it had was promises from the prophets, which most people didn't believe and didn't pay attention to, that a day was coming when a suffering servant would appear on the face of the earth and that he would speak, he would speak mildly and humbly and uh, he would suffer greatly. And he would be not esteemed by us. And people wouldn't even want to look at him. So marred was his face. But out of that suffering servant would come blessing and salvation, not only for Israel, but for the whole world. I am so glad that we are living in the time of the Messiah. That we no longer have to wander in darkness. We don't have to, no, we no longer have to kind of ponder over how these prophecies could possibly put together of the triumph of the Messiah and the suffering of the Messiah. We know now how they come together and they come together in the person of Christ. I am so glad that God has appeared on the earth in the person of Jesus. And when we look at Jesus, we see God and he's spoken to us clearly in sacred scripture. Now we now know the clear path forward. We know now what God's plan is for the human race. We know now how we can be saved, how every bit of goodness and love and tenderness and truth and kindness that we've ever encountered in this world had become eternal, can never end, can be fulfilled. Jesus is with us, and he's so kind and he's so good, and we need to know that he's with us right now in this post-election time. And he's not only here with us in the United States of Canada, but he's with us wherever we are in the world. Whatever's happening in our country, our faith is what overcomes the world. And Jesus will give us the strength to be his witnesses, his joyful witnesses, in a time of tremendous challenge. Thank God we live in the age of the church. Thank God we live in the age of the Messiah. And as certainly as Jesus came the first time and is with us now, he's going to return in glory to judge the living and the dead. 
And those of us who have become his friend on earth before we die are going to be welcomed into the Father's house with these tremendous words. Well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your master. May we all hear those words. May we all draw ever closer to Jesus. I might also tell you that we're going to do a Lenten mission uh, starting in Lent. Uh, we'll have some information on our website, renewalnurseries.net. We're going to continue what we did in our Anvet mission. We're going to uh, continue talking about the wisdom of the saints that we find in the book, The Fulfillment of All Desire, that I've written, but it's not my, my words. It's, it's the words of the saints. We're going to con continue to talk about how to make progress on the spiritual journey. So we're going to do that for four Sundays in Lent and uh, going to be on Sunday evening at 8 o'clock. Uh, you can register on our website. And uh, it doesn't cost anything, but that way we can communicate with you. And it's going to be live, so you can interact with me. You can ask questions. You can make comments. You can greet people that you know around the world. And you can know live and in person that you're part of a worldwide brotherhood and sisterhood of others who are undergoing the same sufferings, but also know the same Lord and are living in faith and in hope and in joy. God bless you. Thank you.